that I um, wanted to go over. And um, I tend to I tend to go out to like Reddit and Discord and uh, hacking news and things, and I and I tend to uh, sort of find things um, online, like questions that people are asking and problems that they're having, and I sort of like um, collect them, if you like, and just see what people are people are up to. The daily trend, indeed, yeah, the daily trend. So I found uh, a few, um, and I found one, and it, and then it led on to another thing, and then another thing uh, that was sort of tightly tight related. And so, actually, let me. Uh, I've got the one final thing I wanted to talk about. Well, let me just actually get the original one up, uh, which was this Reddit post here. Let's see if I can get that in there like that. There we go. Sweet. Let me just zoom that up. All right. Let's go over to uh, there. So you should be seeing the browser there. Double check that in the old OBS. Fantastic. Okay. So this was what a question that I found on Reddit that I that, that was quite interesting. What are the things as uh, things we as engineers don't spend enough time on? I thought this was quite interesting. Uh, some of them I definitely um, definitely agree with. Uh, things like. Um, Backups and, and preventing accidental deletion is, is is probably something that we definitely uh, don't really spend a lot of time on. Naming things was was quite an interesting one. Um, there's actually an article that this person wrote that, that that expands on these things a little bit further. So that's what we're going to actually go on over to. As, as you can see here down the bottom, they've they've written actually put them in an article. Um, it's obviously a bit of a it's so, sort of a sales funnelly thing. Obviously, you can tell. Because um, it goes to like a business website blog, but that's fine. It's it's still good content. Um, code reviews, problem different. So, uh, what are the things we as engineers don't spend enough time on? Code reviews, definitely one of them. One of my b biggest um, things that I go into at companies is the culture around. You know, you're shifting everything over to a code based system. You're codifying everything. You know, you got your infrastructure as code, your configuration as code. And as DevOps engineers, one of the things that you need to be doing is you need to be doing code reviews and per programming and things like that. So code reviews, I'm glad to see that on the list. Uh, problem definition is a good one. Uh, again, the article goes into more details on these. Architecture and design decisions, alignment with other teams. That essentially, um, to me, is just, that's DevOps. Uh, alignment with other teams is something that, that DevOps covers um, very, very clearly. It's very, very um, clear that DevOps talks about collaboration, communication, breaking down those silos, take, just basically merging people into a sort of liquefied, um, sort of melded state where everyone's sort of aware of what everyone's doing and data is just flowing backwards and forwards and we're all aware of, of everything that's happening. And so it helps make better decisions. Giving praise where it is deserved, I think, yeah, I think that's probably a good one. Uh, hiring, reading logs, and communication. Not sure I agree with reading logs. Communication, again, um, sort of falls into number six, really, again, and definitely falls under the sort of DevOps purview. Um, reading logs, not sure about that one. But that was the original blog. That was the original post on Reddit in the DevOps subreddit that I, that I managed to find. So I'm going to just pop down. We'll have a little look at some comments, and then we'll go to the article itself. It's all arbitrary. We spend as much time as we have to, to get the job done to the best of our ability. Mm, okay. I can always spend more time and be better at any single aspect of my role. It's meeting the expectations of the business, which is how I decide what's important. We all want gold standards, best practice, but we have to focus on your efforts where they return some yield. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give that an upvote. I think that that's, that's true. I think, <sighs> I, I think as much as we would like to be as engineers, this perfect sort of, paragon this paragon of perfection where we build these beautiful beautiful uh cities of complexity these systems that are like big beautiful well-planned cities you sort of have to be very fluid and organic in your approach to, to problem solving because ultimately you work you you step out out of your personal life into a commercial life into a um into a business and the business has identified problems that it wants to solve and those problems, when solved, generate income, and that's where your wage comes from. And so ultimately, no matter how much polish you want to apply to things and how good you think um, 
how much effort you think you need to put in ultimately it is down to what the end user wants that the person that the business is serving and if they want a feature put in place that um needs to be done within a week and needs to be rough then you sometimes can't do the code reviews and the testing and the uh, and the whole CI pipeline, it needs to just sort of get out there. Otherwise, your competition will beat you to it. And so I, I see where they're coming from. You just you sort of have to um, meet business expectations here. Um, that's, yeah, no, that's actually a really good point. I like this one, sleep. <laughs> but these personal projects aren't going to develop themselves. Yeah, yeah, I think sleep is obviously uh, very clearly proven to be extremely important. It's an extremely important thing to do to get enough sleep, get your eight hours a day. Um, we've got a couple of, uh, we've definitely got some, um, some mums and dads in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the DevOps lounge. So they can, they can speak more to that than I can. Uh, I've got a, a, a one year old Jack Russell, so, uh, not quite on the kid level, uh, but definitely going to have a toddler for the next, a toddler with a lot of energy. That's extremely fast. Uh, for the next 15 years so I don't really suffer from the whole lack of sleep thing I'm quite good at that I do tend to get to bed probably half nine ten ish maybe the latest half ten and then I read for half an hour to an hour and then uh yeah I usually wake up about seven half seven so I get a good good solid amount of sleep um but that is that is actually a really good comment to, to include in that list is definitely getting more sleep because it's just just so important um second in this with family yeah okay yeah i agree with that i think i like that one let's close these down documentation is yeah that's getting an instant upvote from me um can anyone here in in the in the chat honestly say that the documentation is actually really good um for those of you that are listening could you tell could you honestly say that if i was to come into your organization you wouldn't need to all right, within reason, but you wouldn't need to sit me down and show me everything side by side. Could you honestly say that I could come into your organization and then read some documentation and be developing infrastructure as code and having it tested through pipelines and going live within a week? I bet you couldn't. Cries in Confluence. <laughs> yeah, I have not liked Confluence at all. Yeah, no, Confluence isn't something that, I, that I'm enjoying all that much, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I like this. I like this documentation. Also, if any of you, if any of you like a particular comment or a Reddit post that, that we might look at and you like it enough that you think it should get um, a silver or, or even a gold, just let me know in the, in the questions channel and then we'll, um, I'll, I'll gold it because I've got some coins here I can spend. Um, maintenance and upkeep. Yeah, this is a really good one, actually. Maintenance and upkeep. I feel like with all this MVP agile, fail fast stuff, that the definition of done means out the door and live. And then nobody goes back to make sure that we're following proper maintenance procedures. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is a good one as well. So this is, um, this is a good example of taking a theory that's meant to in practice make everything better in the long run and then using it to um sidestep and avoid doing certain things for example the the agile um manifesto uh, says um one of the things it says on it is sort of it doesn't quite say this but it can be read as don't worry about documentation just write good software, like just get the software written, which I find really funny. I think that's really interesting because obviously you need documentation somewhere. You need documentation for users. Who's, how are they going to know how to use the software um, if, you haven't, if you haven't told them how? And then you're going to need documentation so that other developers can actually work on it and so on and so forth. Um, so I find that's act actually hilarious. Um, but I think that people take it even further uh, with things like MVPs and Agile, um, is it's that sort of just get something in front of the customer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just get something in front of the customer. Um, and then once you've got that thing in front of the customer and then the customer's like, oh, that's really cool. Like do this and do that. 
the business turns around to the developers and the developers have sort of got their hands on the keyboard, right? They're sort of like this, they're like, and they're ready to write documentation. And then the business is like, oh, don't do that. No, like get this, just get this feature in and stuff like that. And they're like, oh, okay. So then you do this feature. And then before you know it, you've gone from day one and you're like, you're, you're six months down the line. You've not written a single, you've not written a single set of tests. You've not written any documentation whatsoever. You're six months down the line and you've got this huge amount of features now, which is, which is, by the way, great because the the product is being changed into something that the customer really wants. And so it's generating that income I spoke about earlier. The business is serving that need. Um, but at, at the same time, no one really knows how <laughs> anything works six months ago. And then you're then moving further and further outside of that DevOps sort of space. You're moving further and further out of it because you're not doing any of the CI stuff. You're not documenting anything. You're starting to build these silos. You don't know it's happening. It's one of those things that's very slow and gradual. It's like the whole um, frog in the in the in the in the cool water um, analogy. You boil it slowly. The the the, the, ant, the frog will will die because uh, it won't know that it's being boiled alive because it's happening so slowly. You don't know silos are forming inside of your organization. Knowledge silos because it's slowly happening over weeks and weeks and weeks as you keep adding features and you're doing this rapid, rapid development. Um, and then you're a year down the line and you don't have any documentation, you have siloed knowledge and you're outside of the MVP stage at that point. You've actually, um, you've actually left the MVP stage um, and you're no longer I mean, a viable product, you're now a viable product. And then it, it only takes a year and a half to get to the point where you're then our product and so it's time to actually start hmm what's a good way of analogy sort of like solidifying things and like going okay well we have this little machine now that's that's ticking along and it's getting inputs and get providing outputs and money's falling out the bottom of it and it's it's working along nicely we've sort of got to like oil that now and, and clean it and and kind of understand how it works and document it and maintain it and start putting testing in place to, pr to prevent um, things from 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 break basically breaking the machine um, so I really like this one maintenance and upkeep yeah um, Dom I just realized I, I could have used a car analogy and saved a lot of typing think of your website as a car people not you Dan you haven't changed your oil in five years oh dear okay that's not good um, no I agree with this uh, wholeheartedly um, Let's have a look what Julia said. I think one aspect is that Agile was born during the peak of TDD, and the whole point is self-explaining code. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one. Like, TDD is one of those ones, as well, one of those things as well, where I, I get the point, and I think it's a good idea, but I don't think you should TDD everything. I don't I don't believe that you should TDD every single unit in your, in your, in your uh, software. It's like, um, if you've got a, if you've got a function that sort of like reverses a string and that's all it does then. Well, um, it's sort of like, well, really? Do I need a unit test for that? It's probably not, it's probably never going to change. And it's probably going to be very unlikely something's going to break that. And so, but if I have a function that then, that like validates user input, well, that's just, that's a different story entirely because we need that validation to be really, really spot on. And then you've got something that, you know, does something with the user data, like um, does some maths against an image or something, well, then that needs to be really, really solid and that, that can't break. And so I think with TDD, you've got to sort of, you've got to sort of pick the things that you need to be certain that you need to test. Otherwise, you're going to test everything um, and you're going to be in a situation where it's actually going to hinder development. It's actually going to, it's actually going to block development uh, and your TDD and your tests sort of then become, almost become your architecture in a sense. Uh, which I guess is what they're sort of trying to do, but at the same time, not get in the way. It, it's, a, it's a strange one. Um, very much, uh, since the other issue was also TDD, was very much for a long time a desktop software practice. Ah, oh, okay. Hmm, okay. I just think that, I think tests are good. I think system tests, module tests, um, integration tests, unit tests, I think including as many tests as you can is a good idea, but just including the right tests of the right things is a good idea. I'm more of a behavior-driven sort of person. I've always enjoyed writing um, behavior-driven tests in, 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 in 
uh, whereby you develop something and then instead of testing every single little component and every little cog it's made from, you sort of step back and you just poke the thing with all the inputs and then you check that behavior coming back um, and you just feed it, sort of like fuzz it as much as you can. You just feed it as much garbage as you can and then it should it should be handling the garbage in a way that's as, uh, as accurate as possible, which essentially is... I'm not going to explode and blow up in your face. Instead, I'm going to gracefully say, that's bad input. And then when I feed you with good input, I want the behavior to go, I've stopped that input for you. Um, I'm just going to resize the size of this uh, thingy on the stream here. Just so it makes it a bit easier to read. There we go. That should make it a bit easier. It's probably okay to, to begin with, but that'll make it a bit easier for you to actually see what's going on. Um, so I agree with this. Um, agile, this MPV agile fast uh, fail fast thing is is about uh, um, yeah, it's not do not doing for me. Soft skills, the ability to calm, convince, persuade, and lead people outside your team and group. Often lack of uh, real connection with the business side of the company. Yeah, that that that's a real good one to me. You know, I'm gonna give that um, I'm gonna give that silver. Um, where are we? I'm, yeah, I really like this one. Uh, I'll give it that actually. Yeah. Being able to communicate with people is is so powerful, uh, and it's and it's so so important. Um, when you develop really sort of actual real human connections with people, you are able to calm, convince, persuade, um, and lead people outside of your your team and group. They 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 develop trust. It's uh, Ray Dalio calls it um, believability, um, and so it becomes a case of if you can. You know, if you if you develop these connections with people, you learn to um, you learn to communicate with people. You you learn to to listen, like truly, like truly, truly listen. Uh, you understand that when someone comes to you or you go to someone else, they've got expect expectations and desires and goals that they want to achieve for their own personal, frankly, for their own personal gain in their career, but also because they've got a particular part of the business that they look after and they have responsibility for and they want to do that to the best of their ability. And sometimes these things can, can they, they don't gel and they and there's friction and they, and, they, and they grind against each other. And so at the end of the day, it's a person. It's not, it's not like a department head or a team leader. It's, it's a human being. And provided you have the capability of being able to listen, go over the go over the problems that we're all trying to solve, come to a come to a conclusion um, that that sort of fits in with everyone's um, expectations and goals and and how they and how they view the world, then you'll end up increasing your believability, and then your relationships will strengthen. They'll get better as time goes on. And you'll find it much, much easier a year, a year and a half, two years, five years, ten years down the line. You'll find it much easier to, to work with those people. And they'll also even become a sort of, it'll be almost like a sort of psychic connection that you almost sort of have where you can make a change to a system knowing that the other person will be good with that. And you get to the point where you don't even really need to go and check with them because you've developed such a good understanding of what each other expects of each other, um, even though you're in completely different departments, that you can um, you can make changes and introduce, and introduce new things without having to uh, get that person's back up. You'll understand that what you're doing is, 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 um, is within the realm of uh, possibility. So that, that's a real good one. I like that one. Understanding total cost of ownership. Understanding total cost of ownership. This is because of sheer lack of experience and overall actually in most senior engineers might just have maybe two, three years sort of experience. Okay, but these are like how many years experience have lots of domains, small domains. Without being responsible for owning multiple pieces of software over an extended period of time, multiple domains. Understanding uh, the universal rules that persist across these aspects of engineering, extremely difficult. Share experience, okay. Uh security, yeah, that's always a good one. Uh, too much to do, so so little time. Yeah, I guess there's always going to be that um, that problem of having lo lots to, lots to solve, not enough time. How do you prioritize things? And then when you do prioritize things, you start doing something, and partway through, you get told to do something else. That's always going to be a thing. 
don't think that's ever going away. We, as a society, as people, we want more, 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 and we kind of want it sooner rather than later. Training, you can build the most wonderful device in the world, but if nobody can figure out how to turn it on, it's useless. Ha! Yeah, I like that. I've lost count of the number of engineers who push out products, both software and hardware, and expect people to just know how to use it. Yeah, I think that comes down to, um, let's see if they mention it, user, that's basically user, user interface design is a UX, essentially. Uh, learn how to give a presentation, go to night school, business course if you have to, but learn that, learn, learn that shit. Learn how to stand in front of a whiteboard and give 10 staff a quick 30 minute training session, followed by a 15 minute question. See, that's interesting, isn't it? Because what does that come back to what I just spoke about? You can say communication, which is what I spoke about before. Um, being able to present an idea. Communication is essentially, uh, is essentially taking an idea that you have, whether it's tangible, whether it's physical, uh, whether you've produced the prototype or whether it's just an idea in your head. And communication is the art of then being able to transfer that knowledge, that idea to other people. That That is essentially what communication boils down to. And that is essentially what's being said here is how do you take that idea and convince others through communication um, that the idea is, is, is a good one. And here it's, I've done something and I need you to understand how that works. Um, so yeah, communication. Yeah, I like that. Uh, someone that turned it. All right. Lots of good comments there. Um, so this was the original 10 things that they came through. And then, like I said, this person wrote it in an article. So if we pop over to that article, we will see it here. Let me just move this over like that. Because then you'll be able to see it better. There we go. Okay. Um, backups and preventing accidental deletion. So this is the first point. Um, have you ever deleted something prematurely only to figure out that there is no backup? Um, have I ever done that? Um, I've never deleted anything prematurely, but when I worked for a company in England, it was pretty much my first proper, um, enterprise grade job. I did, um, get a customer ask me to go into, essentially they had a domain in Plesk and they wanted to add a subdomain that went to that domain. And so I didn't know how to do that. So I spoke to a senior engineer um, who'd been at the company for eight years. And he said, you do this, this, and this. And he showed me how to do it. And I was like, great. So we did this, this, and this. Um, Plesk proceeded to delete the website that was 10 years old. Um, had 10 years worth of work on it. Graphics for games, for all kinds of stuff. And the end result was... By the way, this was at 8 o'clock at night, which is obviously only a few hours away from midnight, okay? Um, and midnight was when it was something like Call of Duty or some, some game was going live. He just basically was like, oh, well, I didn't expect that to happen. Well, I've finished, and so he left. And so this poor customer and I had to spend about three and a half hours frantically looking around for backups of the website. He had to call his developer. This was Christmas Eve. Um, was it Christmas Eve? No, it wasn't quite Christmas Eve. It was like December 20th or something. So the developer, um, this PHP dev guy, um, had to be woken up in, in, um, at night, probably at home with his family. He charged them a fortune. He charged them, my God, it was like £150 an hour or something. Um, he was furious. He had to go and dig, dig out backups. And the end result was um, calling also the graphic designer to get um, about eight years worth of graphics uh, exported again and, and dumped. We got the website up and running again, and he managed to get managed to sell the game. And it was one of the biggest sales of his year, but he was not happy, um, and we did not have backups for that customer. So I haven't accident. I haven't purposely gone out to premature. Um, I haven't actually gone out to delete something on purpose, but I have been involved in a situation where. A lot of data was deleted uh, and there were no backups. So hmm, that was fun. Uh, it's a good way to start your career. Uh, additionally, there are many ways of mitigating the impact of unintentional um, deletions. Uh, you can uh, you can enable versioning on cloud storage buckets. Yeah, that's right. You can configure automated backups. Uh, it's like AWS backups, for example. You can restrict access so that only a few people can delete things. I mean, that's pretty much a given, really. I mean, who's not doing that, right? Um, many databases have additional data recovery features, such as time travel, allowing you to go back in time to run queries as uh, as of the time before 
data had been deleted. Okay, so Snowflake data breaks BigQuery. Okay, that's interesting. What I would say as well is, um, could you also delete deleting data in this day and age? I mean, unless you're at a at a, at a scale of data that's just insane. Um, isn't something that a lot of organizations actually need to do. You could just go into into Glacier, S3 Glacier, um, and you could just literally just put it on ice, super dirt cheap. Uh, you could download it, um, put it on some, some external hard drives or tape drives or something. Uh, and also as well, when it comes to actually deleting data, one thing um, most organizations don't do is they don't codify that process. And I just think if you're going to delete data, um, and let's use a... Let's use an S3 bucket as an example. If you've got data in an S3 bucket, images, videos, whatever it is, and you're and you and you come to the conclusion that, um, yeah, okay, we need to we need to delete that. Um, if you put that, if you do that operation, there's several ways you can do. It. You can go to the web UI. You can use the AWS um, CLI tool. Ideally, you'll have built that bucket in infrastructure as code but let's assume that you, that you haven't done that because most pe most organizations aren't at that stage yet how would you go about deleting it you can use like i said you can use the web ui or the cli tool i'd say that if you actually just wrote um a small a very very small python script in botto okay um with a ci file for gitlab ci right next to it you hard coded the bucket name in and then you push that to a and you made sure that the pipeline was manually gated if you then push that to a um, to a repository, that could then be code reviewed by someone, and so someone else could actually then look at that and go, "That's the script that's going to execute. If you got the right bucket, um, is that the data that we want to delete and so on and so forth?" And then if that then gets approved, right? If that then gets approved, you then merge into the into the main branch. The main branch then runs, and then you can either go in and manually run that pipeline which then runs your python script for you which then deletes the data and then you can, the repository doesn't cost anything the repository is a few kilobytes of data you can just leave it there you can leave the pipeline there with all its logs there etc uh, you wouldn't even need to set up a a, a, pers a private runner for that at all you could actually just use one of GitLab's shared runners you get something like 2000 minutes a month per per project so you could just easily just use a shared runner with a with a python docker image uh, with Botto install, you just do pip install Botto. Uh, you can use CI variables to, to handle the uh, AWS interaction. Uh, and then you can delete those variables after you're done. But what you end up with is, is an audit log of what happened. Who deleted what, who code reviewed it, who pushed it through. Um, it seems extreme, but I just feel that accidentally deleting data is just something that I find just should be so avoidable in this day and age. But yeah. Uh, I I I um, agree that um, backups are definitely something that we need to be we need to be definitely be better at. Um, this was an interesting one. Naming things. Most of them stored are in buckets. Microsoft chose the naming containers rather than buckets for the Azure Blob storage. Why is this confusing? Because containers are typically associated with running instances of Docker images, not with storing blob objects. Yeah, I mean that that is true. Yeah, it's kind of like containers has almost become, um, it's almost become like a verb, really, hasn't it? It's almost like you Google it, right? Oh, we're gonna go Google that, or we're gonna Photoshop that. And it's very true that the the the, the use of the phrase container is now very much associated with with Docker uh, and containerization. So for Microsoft to have used that uh, instead of buckets um, um, is is a, is essentially um yeah it's an interesting one i can't understand why they did that maybe they're just trying to stand out a little bit like because you've got s3 buckets um but then gcp gcs gcs uses the term buckets as well so i don't know why they didn't just go with buckets and just keep it consistent uh, i like this phil carlton quote here there are only two hard things in computer science case and validation and naming things i wonder if um i mean that, that that's a cool saying but i wonder if you knew about um um, distributed workloads be, before he before I wonder if distribution distributed workloads or distributed computing was a thing when he when he coined that one code reviews this is a big one for me personally uh, great technology products are really created in a vacuum they emerge when several smart people support each other in solving challenging problems yep definitely true that's why feedback and code reviews are so critical they serve as a basis for constructive discussions that lead to better engineering processes and better code 
Um, don't write, uh, looks good to me. That's what that means, LGTM. That looks good to me. And approve the pull request a minute after receiving it. Do take as much time as needed to understand the code and the intentions behind it and question whether everything works as expected. Most engineers creating pull requests genuinely want to hear your thorough feedback and learn from your experience. They rely on you to identify mistakes and issues they might not have thought about. Yeah, that's definitely true. Code reviews are um, so important. And that's what I was saying uh, earlier about point one about the backups, right? Is if you were to write a small bit of code, um, pop it in a CI pipeline, you'd obviously just have a little bit of Python script, super simple to just use Barto to delete an S3 bucket and clear everything out of it. Um, if you just did that as code and put it in there, you can you can then get someone to do a code review. They can look at it and go, you've chosen the wrong bucket, or maybe you're not deleting the bucket, but you're deleting a key in the bucket. Um, S3 buckets don't have directories per se. They just have keys, but maybe you're getting the key wrong, and it's like you're meant to be using deleting A, not B, um, and the code review would catch that, and then you would you would not obviously solve the problem of deleting the wrong thing, but you would greatly diminish... Uh, greatly increase your chances of, of getting it right and so code reviews are just so important and there needs to be more of them they also act as knowledge transfer as well um, if you can get uh, if you can get three people to do if you get two people to do a code review so you write your code but then you get someone who can actually approve it and knows what they're doing to to review it and then you can also get a junior to review it as well and the junior is sort of not really there to approve it and say yeah you can go ahead and merge that they're there to do the code review so they can learn from it and they can ask questions. That's very powerful for them. And it's powerful for the organization because that helps um, prevent those those knowledge silos from forming as well. And that's what code reviews actually do. They help knowledge silos. Um, they, they help prevent knowledge silos from forming because everyone's looking at the code and looking at the changes. Uh, problem definition. Uh, you probably answered it many times in your career. Somebody assigned you a ticket saying do X, Y, Z without specifying the why behind it. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the do's and don'ts. Don't create a ticket that prescribes a specific approach, such as build a script that collects data about X and share this data with client ABC as Excel file email attachment. Well, I mean, that's that's there's nothing wrong with that, but it shouldn't be the only thing that goes in there. Do create a ticket that defines the problem. Client ABC needs to receive data about X on a daily basis. Talk to the client and figure out the best interface to share it. Yeah, oh, okay. I guess if you... I mean, the first one implies that they've spoken to the data and uh, they've spoken to the, the clients and they've said we want an Excel file um, as an email attachment. But I guess um, if the person doing the job should maybe do that communication first. Yeah, okay, I see what's, I see what's being said here. Pro problem definitions are definitely um, a big part of, of Agile. And when you're creating user stories, etc., I think the why is important. Um, and sort of explaining... The problem itself and then explaining a potential solution is probably the right answer but i also think that this boils down to your your culture as well your organizational culture what is it um how is it that everyone everyone works uh, how do people want to do user stories and um, what you'll find as well if, if anyone is listening doesn't work in devops or doesn't have um, agile development or scrum or, or kanban or anything like that is that there's no such thing as like the sort of perfect Kanban or perfect Scrum. You're going to go between organizations and it's going to be different between organizations. Some some will use story points, some won't. Some will think of story points as effort. Some will think of story points as time. Some will use the user story. Some will use like epics and then you'll have epics and then stories and then tasks and subtasks. Um, and some just won't, won't do that at all. They'll just have tasks. They'll just have a massive list of things. They'll use projects. Some will use burn down charts to measure uh, performance, um, some won't. And so it, it's really, um, this is a constant battle, especially as a contractor like me, where you move in between organizations all the time. Uh, it can be, it can be, it can be quite difficult, but, um, yeah, I, I do agree with this. I think that having a clear problem definition and making sure you're explaining the why, uh, essentially why it's a problem, who it's a problem for, um, any potential solutions that you may have come up with, include them. Um, but ultimately, the person implementing it should be should be speaking with the end client, speaking with the customer, and saying, um, "I think the theory around how I fix this should be done in this way." And then that should be documented in the ticket as well as comments as you communicate and send emails, so that anyone looking at the ticket, like the scrum master or the project manager or the product owner, 
Um, there are also things that may or may not exist in that organization. Um, they can look at it and see that it's progressing and what's happening and so on and so forth. Um, this is this is just one of those ones that I agree with. Yeah, they, I agree with what's being said here. However, sometimes you can walk into an organization and they're just they're not even um, <laughs> they're not even they're not even doing agile at all. Um, they're, they're they're mixing prints with waterfall or something like it. It's just crazy. Um, architecture and design decisions. Architecture decisions typically have far-reaching consequences. Yeah. Um, typically, I think they all always have far-reaching consequences. Uh, once things are implemented, it's expensive to undo them. Yeah, time-consuming migration. Yeah, definitely. Still, often we don't take time to elevate. Uh, enough options and fail to ask for feedback. The most popular tool may not necessarily be the best one for the problem at hand. Okay, so don't rush implementing the first design drafts or the most popular tool. Do take time to evaluate the architectures or designs uh, or good candidates for the problem at hand. Run proof of concepts. Ask other engineers, stakeholders, external consultants for feedback. Uh, test various options in practice and then decide what works best. And if you're building on serverless, then do use... <laughs> yeah, of course. Um... So essentially, um, yeah, that plug, that was a good one, wasn't it? That was really clever. Uh, I don't mind reading it out. I mean, look, they've written the other. If you're building a serverless, then do use Dashboard's well-architected insights tool. They give you real-time reports. In fact, I'll tell you what I'll do. We'll we'll do a little advert for them. You ready? Okay. Test various options in practice and then decide what works best. And if you're building on serverless, then do use Dashboard's well-architected insights tool that will give you real-time reports on your infrastructure's architecture based on industry best practices, I would tell you exactly what, where, and how to improve. How about that? There you go. That's what they get. They get baby voice. Um, okay. Um, where are we? Look, uh, architecture is a really hard one to solve. There is no sort of... Um, one solution fits all. Yeah, I see what they're saying here. They're essentially saying it comes back to the whole, oh, uh, you know, do, do you guys, uh, what do you do for your front end? Oh, we just use React. And it's like, because it's just what everyone else, what, everyone, what everyone's using. And it might not be the best, it might not be the best tool, you know, why not look at Vue? Why not look at Angular? Why not look at Svelte? You know, there's, there's so many different options out there uh, for, for building for building front end UIs. Why, why just pick React? Oh, it's because Facebook uses it. And it's like, Okay, um, you got to you got to look at different options, right? You've got to you've got to decide what the, is the best tool um, that works for you. But at the same time, I do agree with things like. Um, at the same time, I do agree with things like. Well, we picked React because it's popular. It's sort of like fifty fifty swings and roundabouts because if you think of it, you look at it this way, and this comes back all the way back to what I was saying earlier about ultimately you work in a business that's solving problems, um, which means it's essentially. It's like it's pure economics, it's just the transfer of wealth, essentially. Um, people come to work to make money, and so they're going to pick tools. They're going to pick. They're going to learn tools and use tools that are going to get them work. And so, if companies are using really obscure, es esoteric tools that not many people are using, and for example, think think someone writing a web API in Java, PHP, Node, or Python versus Haskell, what do you think? How many Haskell developers uh, that can do REST APIs do you think? How many of those do you think exist in uh, Toronto or, or London or Brisbane um, versus java developers or php developers or python developers or javascript developers and no js so there is a certain valid argument in well we're going to go with react because ultimately um it's what everyone's using i can see where they're coming from there um because it boils down to sort of economics 101 it's sort of if you have a pool of talent that all knows no js with a few a few haskell developers in there and then you pick haskell if your haskell developers leave because they're unhappy with the culture or management or they get better offers you're going to really struggle to find people who can then maintain that code or you're going to have to pay a lot of money bringing in talent from the existing economic pool of talent and you're going to have to spend money um essentially upskilling them in, in Haskell.
Um, that might be different in R&D departments or in-house project. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, look, if you've got an in-house tool and you're, you've written all of your front end in, in, in React and all your back end in, let's just say, Python, and then you have an internal tool and one of the developers says, why don't we look at Go? Why don't we look at Golang? We're thinking of porting our Python back end. Uh, our REST APIs into Go. So why don't we write that internal tool that we need in Go and then we can use that as a learning exercise. And so, yeah, no, abso absolutely. And I think that's why, I think that that's what they're trying to say here is don't just pick what's best. You know, you've got to find good candidates that solve the problem. Um, and I guess what I'm saying is, is it, that is true. And there's, there's just also a, an, an economic reason why companies will just pick AWS and while they'll just pick GitHub and while they'll just pick React and JavaScript is because everyone knows what AWS is and there's it's got a huge market share and there's a huge pool of talent that you can hire. Everyone um, knows who GitHub is. You know, most people who've done anything with Git will have a GitHub. Everyone knows what JavaScript is because it's the only option in front end and front end development today. You've got web assembly and you've got cross compilation, but what does the cross compilation cross compilate into JavaScript? Um, and everything, you know, everyone knows um, all of these all of these high level tools. Everyone knows what React is, and so you're increasing your chances of being able to hire people, um, and you're increasing your chances of, as you've said here. Uh, as Julia said, time is a factor. Um, is also true. Like if you've got a th if you've got an investment in your business to build an MVP for a product, and you've got three months to prove it, um, you're you're not picking Haskell for the web API. You're not picking Svelte for the front end. Um, you're not picking um, Alibaba Cloud um, for your cloud provider um, because you're going to struggle to find people that know those things well enough today to get an MVP in place in three months' time. Um, you're going to be picking all of the tech to just get you going. Another thing to consider as well is if you have a large talent pool, um, if you have a large talent pool of JavaScript developers in your local city or town, um, the wages drop. So businesses will pick also pick things like, well, we're going to pick React and JavaScript because the, for every... For every one person that can write Svelte or can write Haskell, there are 10 JavaScript developers. And so there's this sort of supply and demand model within economics that has to be taken into account as well. Um, but yeah, no, I, I agree with this. This is something that we definitely need to be spending more time on as engineers is, is, um, is looking at all of the available options. Uh, alignment with other teams. Uh, okay, communication maybe. Sometimes reaching an agreement on common standards is half the battle. Failing to communicate with other teams may lead to frictions and conflicts. Okay. For instance, many data teams invest invested heavily in cloud data warehouses, data ingestion platforms, and SQL-based transformation tools in recent years. Then they started to advocate that everyone should, from now on, use SQL to solve all their analytical problems. Okay. Following the desires, one may think that we no longer need distributed clusters such as Dask and Spark. Or trying to standardize solely on SQL, we forget other teams. What about data scientists and quantitative researchers? Uh, SQL is not enough to solve their problems. The same is true when you need to serve data or consumption by APIs, process automation, and many other interesting use cases that leverage data. For more than for more than reporting, Python would be a much better choice for those use cases. Okay, uh, it's just a article. That was okay. So alignment with other teams. I think that that's one of the core principles. Um, well, it, it is one of the core principles of DevOps is, is collaboration. Uh, with enabling and uh, developing collaboration between um, all of the teams and making sure that you're also, um, with regards to architecture and design decisions, if everyone's talking to each other and saying, uh, like a good example is uh, if you've got front-end developers, back-end developers, and an ops team, and you're not in a DevOps environment, and there's all these walls between these teams, and they're all very siloed, you're going to have like the API team going, we're going to write an API. This is what the this is going to be the HTTP contract we're going to um, present you with. And by that, I mean sort of like the endpoints, what they're going to look like, and the data that you need to send us, and what we're going to give you back. Um, and then the front end team kind of go, cool, that's great. Um, and then they they write that back end in, in Python or, or, or whatever. And then the front end team go and pick React and they start talking to that API. But they haven't communicated the fact that 
um, the the API is going to put validation limitations on some inputs. Um, like you can only you can only provide us because of a limitation in let's just say let's just argue because of a limitation in Python, we can't take more than one thousand and twenty four characters in, um, in a in in a key within a JSON document or whatever because of the library that we're using. And if you didn't collaborate on that, you know the front end developers are going to give. Uh, their, their users, their end users, the ability to, to key in 2048 characters in an input field on the website and hit submit, uh, and it's just going to break. Um, it's a very simple, obviously convoluted, um, contrived example, but it, it's just basically, uh, and then to continue it, and then your ops team are kind of like, hey, cool, we're going to build all this CI stuff, and then the back end team throw the Python over it, and they're like, oh, we, we've built Windows, we've built Windows servers. Um, it's not really, and we can get it working, but it's not really ideal solution. We thought you were going to be writing it in .NET. Um, of course, again, contrived example, these things don't happen really at that scale, uh, at that level. However, um, alignment with other teams and around architecture and design decisions, they're sort of the same thing, that those two things there really, in my opinion, because DevOps is about breaking down those silos and communicating and saying, what problem are we trying to solve? What's the overarching problem that we're trying to solve? Uh, what kind of tech is available already on the market that gets a lot of gets as much of that work done for us? Which of them do we think we can support and we like and have got oh, maybe even open source options, but with a bit of enterprise support or maybe a full enterprise stack so that we know there's a company behind it that costs a lot of money, but we can we can throw tickets at them and they solve things for us and so on and so forth. And you eventually start cherry cherry picking some of the things that you like and then you put them down on the table in front of everyone and you kind of go, is this what we're happy with? Do we think this will do it? And everyone collaborates and then you start going, once you've then done that architectural design decision stage, you're then aligning with everyone, aligning with other teams um, to, to use their own their own wording here. Um, you're, you're then aligning on... Um, how does that thing get implemented? How do we automate this? How, what are we going to do for documentation, uh, testing, deploy, um, code reviews, so on and so forth? And then you start collaborating even further and coming to an agreement on all those things. And then that's when tasks, literally sp specific tasks of getting things done, start actually getting defined and start getting handed to people. And you know, story points start getting assigned to them, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with I agree with both of these things, and I think that's what they're trying to say here is um, you've got to you've got to make sure that you're meeting everyone's requirements and expectations. You can't just close doors, make a decision, and then open the door and just throw it out the door and close the door behind you and be like, "That's what we're doing now." It's purely SQL, and then yeah, these other um, data scientist teams are like, "That doesn't work for us." Um, so I, I agree with that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Giving praise where it is deserved, giving praise or paying compliments may feel awkward sometimes, but we all crave validation uh, to some extent. It's fascinating to see the positive impact of a simple "great job." Um, watch out for false praise, though. People can tell when compliments are insincere. Hmm. Hmm. I think that giving praise where it is deserved is. Uh yeah, it's obviously it's obviously a good idea. I obviously agree with it. Um, I'm just trying to think. Most of the clients that I work for have systems inside of the organization for giving praise. Um, my current client um, is an insurance company, Suncorp. Uh, well, insurance banking. My previous client, the mining company, BHP. These are large enterprises. Uh, over, over, you know, in the tens of thousands of employees, they have um, systems built in um, for making sure that people get praised. Uh, you can post in, you know, either anonymous, anonymously or otherwise, this person did X and it really helped with X, Y, Z. And then it goes into a sort of list and then a big email sent out like, oh, here's our praise and stuff like that. So they, they've got plenty of that. And, and if it's really good praise, it'll be in the stand up the next day and stuff like that. So most organizations have a large, um, have a large degree of um, systems in place to do that for the smaller on the lower end on the, on the smaller scale startups scales and stuff like that um yeah i think it's definitely important to make sure that there are systems in place so that people are being recognized for the hard work that they're doing um i, de I definitely agree with that i don't think really much can be, can be said on this um i like julius there what he said there uh, but great job can't substitute the issue of no overtime pay absolutely yeah um from a you know you can say oh that's a that's a really good job um but of course, if that person 
Uh, I've, it's funny, actually. I was watching, started watching a documentary yesterday on the 996 problem in China, which is the working from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week, and it, how it's actually expected. Um, and it's, um, yeah, like that, that falls. Um, 99996 ICU, yeah, exactly. Um, it's, um, it's a problem. It really is. You can't say great job when someone's just done 12 hour days for six days straight, which is just crazy. Like, that is just mental. That, that is utterly mental. What is that? That's 60, 72 hours, is that roughly? Um, oh, that's just nuts. You can't just, you can't substitute that with a great job. That needs to be, uh, that comes back to the other Reddit comment earlier about sleep. Um, <laughs> no, don't, don't tell me great job. Tell me that I've got Friday off so I can get some sleep. So yeah, uh, it's one of those things. It's difficult. Okay, hiring. It's challenging to find and manage engineering talent these days. Still, hiring prematurely and then firing people can harm the company culture and team morale. Many adopt the hell yes or no approach. What's that going to link to? Enterworks.com. Okay. Uh, hell yeah. Well, I've never heard of that approach. Whichever strategy you choose, it's, it's advisable to take time and be intentional about the team you want to build. Absolutely. Uh, again, this all boils down to uh, communication and uh, collaboration and you know when you're hiring people are you hiring people that can communicate ideas can they talk are they honest um, are they willing to learn or can they grow as people and so on and so forth um, has anyone anyone who's watching have you ever had uh, have you ever hired anyone or had anyone in a team is just a really bad hire um, I, I definitely have um, let's have a look at whatever this uh, hell what's this hell yes I'm intrigued that text is smooth Okay, let's move that over there. The interview is maintaining smoke rooms and people are very important to me. Having 500 and a fact, the interview. Hang on, hell, hell yes. Hiring, it's hell yes or no. Okay. Oh, I see. Right, okay. Sorry, I get it. It's either the person is a hell yes or, or they're just a straight no. So if they're not a hell yes, you don't hire them. Okay. When hiring, there are only two options, hell yes or no. Okay, I get it. Uh, would I be excited when I'm evaluating a candidate? I'm interested in hearing their story. I'm not first concerned with salary demands or the technical ability. I'm most definitely not concerned with the role we are trying to fill. I simply want to know what makes them tick, what they are passionate about. Yeah, yeah, what they are passionate about, and if they have the fire in their belly. I agree entirely. Um, I did. I, I, this is because it was early on in my career. I, I never do this these days, but I remember doing like a three-stage interview for rack space and it was overall probably over four hours worth of interviews if i remember, remember rightly and one of them was a good hour and a half two hours sitting down with uh two two of the uh, team leaders who were um technically minded but more management and hre sort of communicate kind of people um very very extroverted kind of people uh, and and they were awesome um they, they, they were really good uh, ava was my manager and she was amazing um, he was a great manager and they were checking for personality. They were checking for communication skills, um, how you would handle conflict and, uh, what, how would you go about learning something new? Uh, and how, you know, do you actually care about this? Is this a paycheck to you or do you genuinely sort of care about serving people and, and solving problems? And the technical interview was probably about 45 minutes to an hour so the the sort of we're checking for passion um we're checking for what makes them tick we're checking for passion we're checking for the fire was definitely something that rackspace took much more seriously than do you know how a low bouncer works like they checked that i knew how a low bouncer works they had me whiteboard simple architectures for mysql servers and clusters and things and low bouncing and linux and general HTTP traffic and stuff like that because uh, they want to know where you stand right um, but they would take on people who um, sort of would say you know I, I've got a rough idea of how a load balancer works which to me is like a re it's a really simple thing most people sort of get how a load balancer works but they would still hire those people because the the, the second interview of do you are you passionate do you want to learn um, they just smashed they were just they were just really smart people who loved what they were doing. They had the potential. Yeah, that's right, the potential um, to get the job done, to learn. And so they got hired. And then they went on to become really, really good engineers. Um, I think for the longest time, only people 
uh, can bullshit their way through, get hired. Also, the myth of the ten times engineer. Yeah, I've never really got that ten times engineer thing. Um, I know, I, like, I know what it means, and I know what you're, you're, you're referring to, but oh, just some of the things, some of the ideas that people people come up with, it's just mental. Um, would I be excited to have this person at Interworks? So if the answer is they were okay, yeah, I kind of like them, or even worse, they could do the job. Then the answer is absolutely no. Um, you don't know. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, Wikipedia ten times engineer let's see wikipedia has got on it oh there we go seven pages. what's this so the 10 times engineer is like the super engineer that can like 10 times their output they're like they're super good they're like yeah think mark zuckerberg steve wozniak elon musk like the 10 times engineer is this like brilliant mind is nearly but not quite overshadowed by his bizarre outbursts on twitter it's like yeah i think this guy from silicon valley the guy that creates the pi piper protocol um like gray beard yeah yeah possibly yeah um, if i if i understand what you mean by gray beard then yeah i think so um but they're essentially um they're essentially this engineer that can just like they just know everything like they just they get it they get maths they get programming they get infrastructure they just get computer science uh again you know this, this guy here from um from pi piper where he develops this thingy this uh in, a compression algorithm He's like that's like the sort of meme of a of a ten times engineer. Yeah, they they know just everything and they just push out insane amounts of work really quickly, and then that then cascaded and became this thing where companies started like looking for and marketing for this ten time engineer. They'd be like, like, are you a ten times engineer? Like, you should come come work for us. Um, but it's it's it, it is also bullshit. Yeah, it, it doesn't it doesn't even make sense. Uh, it's an engineer who's ten times better at their job than their peers. That's the, yeah. That's essentially the the sort of breakdown of it, um, and it is it is bullshit. It's not just thing. Um, there are people. There are certainly people who are extremely. Of course, there are people who are at the top of the pyramid, right? There are always people who pe perform um, at an extremely high level. If there weren't, then we wouldn't have the Olympics. Like we wouldn't have elite special forces. You know, Navy SEALs wouldn't exist. Olympians wouldn't exist. Um, there are always people who push hard and and. But they're not ten times, they're, they're, they're ten times better at their job because they've gone ten times harder than everyone else. Maybe even twenty or thirty times harder than everyone else. Whereas most people, if you think of something like the eighty twenty principle, like eighty percent of the population um, can be twenty percent as good but get eighty percent of the work done. So most of the population can be can be a fraction as good but will get get you eighty eighty five percent of the way there. And then you might need someone who's just slightly better than them to get you the rest of the way there. Um, but you most certainly don't need to be 10 times better um, at your job than other people. It's, yeah, it's utter, it's utter bullshit. Um, and the big issue with 10 times engineer is uh, create an anti-pattern like knowledge lock star programmer. Yeah, yeah. So the company rise, so the company rise and fall depend on a single person. Absolutely. Yeah, no, spot on. That's that, that person is sort of like an instant silo that comes into your business. Like... If you have a team of four and then they come in and they complement it and they make that dream team of five, it's really a team of one. And the 10 times engineer gets elevated and sort of, you know, oh, lifted up like some kind of divine entity on, on a plinth. Uh, they get risen so high that it's almost as if everyone else is sort of their, like, their, 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 their assistant and they're there to support them. But then, of course, you end up with this single person that's just a solid silo. Um I think we get that now. We can come off that. Uh, who's this? Who's this silo of of knowledge um, that can make or break a company? Uh, I read the Phoenix Project, and they warn about the bottlenecks of having talent that everyone has to go to. Yeah, absolutely. What was his name in that? Was it Brett? Was it was it Brett or Brent or something? It was the guy in the Phoenix Project who was that sort of? He'd been there for like something like that. Yeah, he'd been there for like fifteen years, and everything was in his head, kind of thing. Exactly right. Um, although even that's not really an example of a 10 times engineer. That's just someone that's been there a very long time and has all the knowledge in their head. Um, yeah, no, it's just a bullshit. I like this. Yeah. The hell yes or no. Okay. That's quite a good idea. Yeah. I guess that, um, <laughs> just laughing cause I've just read, read down a little bit further. I can see another plug. So I think baby voice is gonna, gonna make a return. Uh, many adopt the hell yes or no approach. Yeah. I like that. It's sort of like if the candidates making you feel really excited, 
um, like, oh yeah, I definitely want to work with that guy. Um, then you, it's a, it's a hire. And I think this is definitely more true for, um, when you're hiring in teams with, um, permanent, permanent employment as a contractor, uh, I run the risk of, uh, not meeting expectations when I go into a client and then all they've got to do is give me one week's notice. Um, and that's it. It's over. And so, but that's, 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 um, that's the risk I take when contracting and it's a risk they take when hiring a contractor because I can also go, this company doesn't meet my expectations and I can leave within a week as well. Um, so yeah, that's why the wages are higher. So I agree. I think your hiring processes definitely need to, um, they, they need to have a very sort of clear goal of what you're trying to hire. You're trying to hire for, you know, technical skill and technical knowledge, or are you trying to uh, find the right people who can grow, grow with the organization? Because uh, no one business really is going to solve just, just sort of like one problem. It's going to grow with, with the economy and solve multiple, multiple problems for multiple people. Uh, some issues, okay, reading logs. Some issues in injuring stem from not reading the logs properly. True story, in my first consulting job, consulting project, sorry, we were working on a Hadoop cluster and I had difficulties figuring out why my Spark job has failed. I, um, I asked a colleague and he pointed me to a Java stack trace with the error message, which I seemed to have overlooked in a large directory of log files. I had to shamefully admit that he was right. The answer, well, shouldn't shouldn't shamefully have had to admit that, but the answer was in the logs. It didn't take long en- I didn't take long enough to read it thoroughly. Okay. Yeah, I think um, log files are actually they're actually a pretty hard problem to solve. Um, log files are log files, metrics, um, observability, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, I, I don't know why I put it in quotes. It's it, it's a valid it's a valid thing. Um, but looking at uh, log files and, and metrics and stuff is it's a hard problem to solve. I would say almost it's almost a job in and of itself that you bring someone in who can get that in place for you because log files are, you know, text can be compressed really well. Metrics can be compressed really well. But when you're talking, you know, gigabytes per hour of, of logs, you've got to, you've got to store that somewhere. Um, it's got to be historically, uh, well, actually it doesn't have to be historically searchable in my opinion. I think you should be consuming logs and then I think you should be either deciding whether you want to keep them or not. Like I turn access logs off and error logs off in nginx in most cases because i never ever review them um i use google analytics when i want to look at traffic and so i mainly just turn them off because they just fill up the disk and then they actually become a they actually become a uh, become a problem um but it's a hard problem to solve um i like the plug here where i think we're okay with that one um but let's have a look is this the dashboard is it okay this is dashboard so that's what they're that's what they're selling all right okay yeah. Very nice. Okay, communicating. Whee! This is the big one, in my opinion. I actually think that communication communication should be the number one thing, and it should be the um. Um. No worries, Vince. Uh, go yeah, go grab some sleep, mate. Um, remember we talked about that before. How important that is. <laughs> thanks for coming. Thanks for watching, mate. I really, really appreciate it. Um. Thanks for streaming again. Yeah, it's going to be a weekly thing. It's actually twice, twice a week, Wednesdays and, and Sundays. But um, yeah, every Sunday is going to be at least uh, an hour and a half to two hour stream. So yeah, no, thanks for coming, mate. Really appreciate it. Um, okay, number 10, communicating. I think this is the overarching one, in my opinion. Uh, everything that we produce, everything that we do is for, is because of and for people, uh, because of some communication that's come from somewhere that uh, essentially um, results in us needing to do needing to do something needing to um take an action or or do something and if you can communicate things well then the thing gets done quicker better more accurately and so yeah i think it's i think it's super important let's see what they say did you know that most it projects fail due to communication issues yeah i I am very aware of this uh we have more communication tools than we ever had in history yet it's challenging to find a balance between under and over communicating don't send 50 short messages every 20 minutes. Do think about what needs to be communicated and write it down first. 
excuse me, think what's best channel to communicate this, an email, if wants to do a response is fine, a call, if it requires a decision or screen share or an instant message, if it's critical or something that blocks you. I'd reverse them. I'd say an instant message should be if it requires a decision or a screen share and a call should be if it's critical or something that blocks you. I think maybe maybe they got that wrong. I, I feel if they've, they've got that the wrong way around personally. Um Hmm. Okay. I look communication to me is just super critical. Um, there is there is no two ways around it in my opinion. Um, a call is more urgent. Yeah, I agree. I think a call. I think they've got that uh, the wrong way around. And I'd also say um, one thing I would say as well is this sort of that a lot of those those three options there they're completely digital and they're completely disconnected. Um, I would replace call with. Go and, go and stand at their desk and speak to them. Obviously, I understand today's day and age, that's becoming less and less a thing. But if you're in an office with people, I wouldn't call them. Um, like, I, if I go into a client's site and there's a phone on, on the desk, I make it very clear that I won't be sat there answering that phone call. Like, I will not do that at all. I will say to them, that, that gets unplugged. Um, I, don't, I don't answer phone calls. If you want to communicate with me, you come and talk to me like a human being. Um, I, I very much dislike office environment. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, quite a few people are starting to uh, feel the same way, mate. Um, I think um, I would replace call with with face to face. But overall, I do I do agree with this that thinking about how you're going to communicate something, uh, the medium you're going to use to communicate it, um, is definitely an important part of um, any organization and any IT project. Uh, make sure you're getting out there and. Um, Communicating ideas very clearly, very precisely. Think about what you're going to say. Uh, a good a good uh, rule of thumb can be: should I should I send this email? So write the email, save it as a draft. This is especially true if someone within a project has done something that's pissed you off. It can definitely be a good idea to write out that email or write out the IM message, and uh, even even in something like Notepad where you can't accidentally send it um, and then you just come back to it an hour later. Just take a step back, come back to it an hour later and then decide if that's something that you then want to send. I guarantee that if you read it back to yourself, you'd be like, whoa, okay, yeah, I shouldn't send that. Um, that was something that I, I learned at Rackspace. It was one of the skill sets that they, they taught at Rackspace was was good communication, when to communicate, how to communicate, what to communicate, so on and so forth. So I personally think this, this should be at the top, the very, very top of the page. Uh, this should be number one, but yeah, I agree entirely. And I'd, yeah, the 50 short messages every 20 minutes, I guess it depends on the project and what you're doing. But yeah, I think I think um, more precise, better communication is def definitely necessary. Okay, that is what... Um, but Dashboard don't sell communication tool. Yeah, that's true. They sell... Um, I've not even looked. Let's have a look. Come on, let's give them a little bit of a serverless observability. All right, let's give them a little bit of a... Screen time here. Monitor serverless applications at any scale. End-to-end -end observability and real-time error tracking for AWS Lambda applications from developers to developers. Very nice. Okay. Um, probably why communications at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, quite possibly. Um, serverless monitoring observability. That's a good idea. Um, serverless is a whole new uh, architecture, a whole new paradigm. You know, how you go about um, actually monitoring everything kind of serverless architecture uh, application is is difficult um it's certainly not something that um it's certainly not something that's simple by any stretch of the imagination it's not easy you don't just do it and then it's just done um it's it's much more complicated than that in, in, in a um in a serverless environment so yeah i can see why they've written this feed this product nice Let's have a look. I like that you insist on face to face. Obviously, there's a lot of nonverbal communication that go into into human. Absolutely, I think isn't something like seventy percent of human communication is is visual, like seventy, seventy five, maybe even eighty percent. Um, it's very much sort of like um, facial features and tone. That things that just don't come across in an instant message or or, or in an email. Um, it's definitely something that uh, does not work. So there are certainly types of communication that just simply do not work via 
via digital communications at all. Yeah. Let's have a look what we got here. Uh, else I've got in here, right? Technical blog. Delos, how would you? Oh, okay. Oh, that's interesting. I thought I'd done that one already. Let's close that one. Um, yeah, I wrote recently. I updated um, a section of the book, actually. Uh, let me just... Um, a video will be going out on YouTube about this soon. And I definitely need to fix up this... Um, Definitely need to fix this up, but um, I sort of question on on Reddit with regards to should I write a technical blog and will it help with getting a job? And so I wrote this 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 question this answer out here, and uh, I came to the conclusion that I think that more people should should write a technical technical blog. It doesn't have to be something that you blog about every single day. It doesn't have to be something that's uh, kept up to date. It's not, a, it's not a, you know, it can be ephemeral. You can write the blog post and then you can just sort of walk away from it. But what I, what I say here is I feel that um, by writing a technical blog post, you are greatly in improving your chances of, um, of getting, a, getting a job, in my opinion. You're greatly improving your chances of getting a um a job with an employer just for the simple simple fact that you've taken the time to write something down you've clearly demonstrated that you can communicate an idea uh, in a very clear and concise manner and i just feel that it's an important um the sweet sweet clout yeah it uh, i think i understand what you're saying there when you look when i i, I um interviewed for Suncorp, my latest engagement they literally, uh, during the interview, uh, 35 minutes, by the way, interview. It was about 35 minutes. Um, one interview, the entire interview, 35 minutes. Um, five minutes of it at the end was pretty much them just saying, uh, we're not even going to bother asking you your technical questions because we've seen your streams, we've seen your YouTube channel, uh, we've seen your book. And so it's obviously very clear that you're capable of doing the job simple now don't get me wrong i'm not saying everyone should go out there and start streaming and producing videos and writing books they're not they're not small uh they're not small pieces of work um but if you write a technical blog and you put um side project yeah side projects if you've got a github uh repository if you've got a uh, a, a collection of side projects that you've that you're either developing or or have just developed you get that on your linkedin you write a technical blog where you explain what it is that you were doing, why you were doing it, how it solves a particular problem, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then you make people aware of that. When you go into an interview, not only will that actually pretty much help you get the job, or sorry, help you get the interview, but during the interview, you can point out these resources. And most employers, if they're, if they're even worth working for, will, in my opinion, they'll do some background checks on you. They'll, they'll, they'll research you. And if you've put on your CV, I've got a blog, they will go They will go and check that blog out. And so it can be a really good idea to... Um, another thing you can actually do as well is if you know you're going to apply for a particular job, so say you're going to go for a front-end developer job uh, at some bank or some some company, some startup or whatever, and it's um, you, know, you, you say, I'm going to apply for that, I'm going to apply for that um, in a few days' time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create an open source project over the next few days where I demonstrate what I'm capable of doing. Then what you do is when you apply and you do your cover letter, you put that in there as an example of your work. And you put it up as a, as a, as a GitHub repository. Uh, you make sure your commits as you commit to things make sense. Maybe even throw a semantic version on there and sort of do everything sort of properly as a, as a micro project. And you enter into this situation where in the cover letter you're, you're able to say, not only have I got a code here and a small project that you can look at, um, but I've written a blog post here um, and you don't even need any infrastructure. Just go to medium.com. It doesn't matter. Just go to medium.com. Literally just sign in with your Google account. You don't even need to provide any login details and just write about that repository um, or even just the GitHub page exactly and then um, write about it show them that you're capable of taking a complex technical idea and communicating it to other people in, in plain English, uh, understanding the why it, it uh, why the problem, what problem exists, uh, why it needs solving, how you've solved it, why you solved it in that way, 
uh, why you selected those particular technologies and so on and so forth. And then you put that in front of the employer along with your cover letter and your CV, and it will greatly enhance your uh, ability to even get your foot in the door without, without just without any without any question or doubt. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to give you a little uh, a little update there. Where I just wrote this out. Uh, I've got a video on this just going out on YouTube. Just a quick four. That's about four minutes, five minutes. Sort of just reinforcing this as well. But yeah, no, I found I thought that was a, a really really interesting one. Um, let's have a look what else we've got over here. Uh, which one should I pick? Uh, yeah, I want to cover this one as well. This is going to be a uh, an interesting video. Uh, this will be an interesting one to cover. Is uh, uh, which one should I pick? Should I pick GitHub Actions or GitLab? So this is an interesting one. I'm a, I'm a massive GitLab fan. Um, oh, sorry. Let me just see what Julia said there. The the funniest one I did for that kind of thing was here is my resume and my resume latex code. <laughs> Jeez, yeah, nice. Um, which one should I pick, GitHub Actions or GitLab? I'm a, I'm a massive GitLab fan. Yeah, I, I, I really like GitLab. I like the uh, all of the integration with the CI pipelines, very mature CI product. Um, I think it's pretty, to me, this is fairly obvious, but at the same time, even though GitHub Actions is relatively um, new and sort of, and sort of, uh, it, it, sort of, it's new to the market, right? They can learn a lot from how everyone else is doing it. Um, but for me, the answer here would just be, would just be GitLab. Uh, either will work. If you're using GitHub, uh, then GitHub action probably makes the most sense. Head to head comparison. I think GitLab has better CI CD features though. I, I agree. It definitely does have, um, definitely does have the better sort of features. However, um, I also agree with use the thing that's closest to your code. So if you're already using GitHub, it makes sense to use GitHub actions because it's just right there. Um, you know, it's sort of like if you're in a kitchen making food, you know, which, which set of pot and pans should I use? Well, you don't use the ones in your neighbor's kitchen because you use the ones that are right in front of you, right? Because they're the ones you have availability to. So, yeah. Uh, I think the one thing should be done is create the pipeline job in such a way that the service pass the job to the, to, to a neutral tool like Nix or test file. Yeah. I see what you're saying that I, I, I like to use, um, yeah, I like to have my CI jobs essentially bring in a shell script from within the repository to do the CI work itself. It's something I've been doing more recently, which is you have a sort of CI folder and then you have your your tool, your, your shell scripts in there, which are as agnostic as possible. And then you get your CI tool to essentially run those things so that if you then need to move to Jenkins or GitHub Actions or anything else, all you're really doing is just changing the syntax of the CI file to work with that environment and then you're just running the same shell scripts again. So yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I definitely agree that don't embed yourself too heavily in that CI solutions implementations, which is why I don't like, I really don't like, um, I was looking at a GitHub, GitHub Actions file and it, they use a lot of um, actions um, where, yeah, like Azure DevOps does it as well, where you, you use actions and you say, oh, I want to do a Docker pull action version 1.2 of that action. And here's the image that I want. And then they do stuff in the background to pull the image for you. And it very much is vendor binded wording. It's very much a vendor lock-in actually. Whereas um, I don't recall if GitLab even, even supports that. I don't think it does. Uh, but with GitLab, I just use script. Um, script calls and I either just do an inline script if it's really tiny and simple or I I use a script file and I say run that run that shell script there um, so the most the most it support is a service bind yeah so I just don't um, I don't like that at all it's one of those things uh, github actions uh, does let's that, take a look let's have a look uh, github actions um, what were they called? They were called something else, weren't they? Features. Let's have a look at the documentation, see what we can find. Um, let's get this ramped up so everyone can see it. Learn GitHub Actions, learn about continuous integration, package monitoring, troubleshooting, view all guides, popular workflow syntax for GitHub Actions, events that trigger, context, environment variables. Sorry, let's have a look at this workflow syntax here. <coughs> let's have a look.
GitHub Actions used to be HashiCorp configuration language, really. That's awesome. That would have been way better. Um, let's have a look. GitHub Actions is available. GitHub free. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jobs, concurrency, jobs. All right, let's have a look at a job. Workflow jobs, runners. I'm trying to just find sort of an example of like an action or something. Um, learn YAML in Y minutes. Nice. Name on single example on event example. Okay. These types. Branches, tags, non branch tags. On push. I like that sort of language. That does make it nice. Like on push of those branches sort of makes it somewhat more readable. Um, but I really want to find. Uh, let's see if we can find the actual reference. Are they, are they commands? Is that what they're called? Workflow commands? Actions can communicate with the runner machines. Is set environment variable output values, blah, blah, blah. Run, run. I don't think that's the same thing. I think that that's what I'm thinking of, I don't think. Uh, environment using limits, building, workflow syntax, context, and expression. Let me zoom out here so I can get a thing on the side. That's the reference. Creating actions about actions. You can create actions by writing custom code that inherits blah, blah, blah. You can use API, public third body, for example, blah, blah, types of actions. Docker containers, JavaScript, composite actions. Okay. Choosing a location for your action, compatibility, using release. Uh, this is it. This is it. This is what I don't like. Um, I don't like this user's syntax here. I don't like that. Yeah, I don't like that. Um, the fact that it's like we have a JavaScript action and there's a version attached to it. Um, it's way too much abstraction. Yeah, I agree. Um, So where do I find um, GitHub Actions predefined actions like the pre-made stuff? Um, Two hundred extraction as an org workflow features GitHub Actions documentation. I want to find. Run, run, run. See, it should just be. You got to do that every time. So you got to do steps, and then you got to do run, and then the script, and then run, and you can't just create it, give it a list of line line by line items of the shell script, and then you just mix it with this users actions checkout v two. Okay, um, I just yeah, I don't know, I just don't like that sort of. Um, I just don't like that sort of, um, yeah, that abstraction. It just feels, it feels too much to me. Um, install, da, 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 change the action, change the code, require actions core. At the same time, I sort of get it. I sort of get what's, um, I sort of get what's, what they're trying to do. They're trying to say, you know, you can take this stuff you can produce these actions from it and then you can use it in multiple workflows. Like I sort of get that. That does make sense. But at the same time, I don't know, just, just write a shell script, I guess. Write a, or write, write a Python. Like if it needs to be in Python or JavaScript, just write the, write the script to do the thing and then just run it. Um, but it become the legacy Jenkins situation again. Do you mean these actions or shell scripts? We've looked at that one. The the locking to a vendor with their wording specification. Yeah, it definitely is a sort of 
tightly integrated vendor lock-in and I try and steer people away from that as much as I can, when, especially when it comes to CICD because it's one of those things that just, it's sort of the thing that is, from an operational perspective, it varies the most, it changes the most, you update that the most um, from, from an office perspective. Um, let's have a look. Geekbob Actions works fine for small logs, small format for anything larger has a lot of issues. Uh, things like lack of support of inside org private actions includes all YAML anchors. Um, well, I wouldn't probably use them anyway, to be honest. Uh, manual steps, bad UI for run history, and maze of metadata availability in various layers. Okay, interesting. Since they're already on GitHub, in my opinion, you should consider what's available there. GitHub Actions, Travis, Circle CI. Most likely determinant factor would be the price of each of these services. Yeah, I think if you're already in GitHub and they are, I missed where they said that they, they are, um, then I would use GitHub Actions personally. Um, and then if you did want to use something that potentially was more powerful, I would be reviewing the other options like uh, Travis and Circle CI. Definitely. GitHub is an entire ecosystem. If you're already on GitHub, use that. Uh, personally, I prefer GitLab because of it's self-hosted for free and my home is simpler to work with. Agreed. Agreed entirely. Um, I think it is the better the better solution by far. Uh, even, the free, even the free version has more features than GitHub. It does, yeah. Um, okay, moving from GitHub is a hard sell for an intern to say, hello company, you should use GitLab and move all your repos. Um, it, hard sell for, maybe it's a hard sell for an intern, but is that an intern's job to be doing that? Um, it's not really in, for an intern to be doing that, right? Um, also, have you seen Concourse? I haven't, no. Rip, tr Rip to Travis shot themselves in the foot. Oh, Travis CI. How did they do that? What did they do? I know I know what Travis CI is, but I'm not, I, don't, I don't know why they shot themselves. I'm not seeing Concourse, no. Is Concourse a CI thing? Concourse, CI.org. They alienate the entire... Did they? How did they do that? Uh, Concourse is an open source continuation thing doer. Uh, built on simple the mechanisms of resource, tasks, and jobs, Concourse presents a general approach to automation that makes it great for CI/CD. Okay. Let's have a look. Uh, built in the open. That's, yep, yeah, that, that's called open source. Um, key features. Okay, so comments is designed to be uh, expressive, versatile, and safe, remaining intuitive as the complexity of your project grows. Um, pipeline explained. Okay, I'll take a look at that in a sec. Visualize to verify. Okay, configure as code. Yeah. Plan, get toolkit, trigger true, test file. Pipeline, like a distributed break file. Booklet, unit, bunk test, I'll see. Okay, CI auto source control. Does it give me anything? It doesn't seem like it doesn't really stand out. Also for Travis, because they changed their pricing, removal of the Travis.org and changed to Mac. I need to I need to look at this, Travis. CI. Concourse looks good. Doesn't look any, like anything special to me though. Building on Travis Seattle August ceased. Please use Sears.com from now on. Right, okay. Is there a way to test and employ your projects? So dot org or dot org is deserved for not for profit organizations. That's the point of the TLD. And so they essentially got rid of the free for open source. Um Testing your open source project will always be free. Seriously, always. Oh, that ate like milk, didn't it? Um, get, up to, get up, get up in seconds. Su support your platform. Test your. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, you push your code to GitHub. Trigger, but yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and then they went to dot com. So what was the price? Oh yeah. Okay. Free trial. Oh wow! So you just don't have a free free tier at all. No credit card required for free plan. But you don't. You don't have a free plan listed. Uh, 
not a complete uh, travesty. Nice. Travesty I tries to tries calming open source users after price changes and perceived quality drop. Uh, super question open source project made Travis CI last couple of weeks project manager Paul the Gordon taking the company's blog to ensure you use okay let's go straight to their word rather than um second hand information uh we've recently had a lot of feedback and questions from Travis CI community and beyond about the future of open source at Travis CI following our recent announcement about how we are tackling accounts that are taking valuable resources away from your builds okay oh god I'm behind behind the times here aren't I uh, open source has always been and always will be at the core of what Travis CI stands for. Um, let's have a look. We're also partnering with leaders, open source, IBM, ARM, give projects, build, test, deliver software. Uh, over 300,000 other open source projects trusting the speed and reliability of Travis CI. We're confident that our recent changes have brought the abuse of open source at Travis CI under control, ensuring resources available to all developers and teams. Hmm... Also, we are fast approaching the end of a lengthy migration process from .org to .com, which was initially announced in 2018. Um, this migration enables all accounts, including open source, to receive the benefits of new features and infrastructure improvements under a single platform. Open source accounts, as always, will be completely free on the Travis.com. Okay. Uh, we're looking forward to engaging with our ever-growing open source community. Uh, but yeah, most open source communi community have changed to use GitHub Actions or Alternative. Interesting. Well, I mean, it stayed free. They just they just moved to they just changed their platform. They just changed the um they just changed the domain. So that's hmm. Interesting. Well, click on the recent announcement at the top. What do you mean? Oh, that. Yeah, uh, long service uh, new pricing, what pricing change mean? Okay, if I can run it, upcoming price changes, building on macOS and macOS builds, builds need special care and attention. We want to make sure builders on Mac have the highest. $15 will buy you 25,000 credits, one minute of Mac build time costs 50 credits. I hate price and models like this. It's like, oh, you give us. Um, you give us uh fifteen dollars and we'll give you seventeen Stanley nickels, uh, which convert in which are one Stanley nickel will get you twenty five shrew bucks, which is the equivalent of a unicorn to a leprechaun. Um, it's like just just give me just one minute of Mac build time costs fifty credits. Okay, cost so just just put that here. Just put fifteen dollars will get me. Then the work out that mats for me and just put gets me so many minutes here. I hate that. It really winds me up. Use your credit for I need to run those, replenish your credits as you need them. Um okay, so kind of for those who are still kicking the tires, we are on switching the plan for one hundred builds on private repositories, a free trial, ten thousand credit allotment. Just build on whichever environment you like. Okay. Building on public repositories only. Yeah, I don't think um I don't think there's that much of an issue uh, here from from my perspective, but yeah, maybe a lot of people are obviously, clearly obviously pissed off with the Mac changes. But I, I think building on on Mac so is is actually quite difficult. Uh, what's it if you can't build my builds? Um, yeah, okay. From an open source, but all right, let's have a look. Oh, Jeff. Okay, Jeff Gerling. Yeah, I like Jeff Gerling. Okay. Um, let's have a look. I just spent six hours migrating some of my open source projects from Travis CI to GitHub Actions, uh, and I thought I'd port. Okay, I need a need a read a read a mode there. Um, did a little, and I thought I'd pause for a bit. Twelve hours into this project, probably f fifteen to twenty more hours to go to jot down a few thoughts. Wow. Okay, I'm not the one, not one to look a gift horse in the mouth. For almost a decade, Travis CI made it possible for me to build and maintain for years hundreds of open source projects. I built Raspberry Pi, Python, do, 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 do. okay, without the, the testing ability to test schedule, I would have abandoned most of those projects, but with the testing, I'm able to keep up uh, with build feature, build failures introduced by BitRot over the years and review PRs more easily. Yeah, okay. From the outset, Travis CI was built to integrate with GitHub, 
uh, repositories and offer free open source CI. At one time, it was showered with praise on Hacker News and elsewhere for its culture and ethos. But as the years passed and other CI uh, systems became much more popular until to, until late 2018, GitHub dropped the bombshell that GitHub Actions and it seemed like other Outlook Travis CI went to. This is fine. Yeah, okay. Now, to shed a little more light on where precisely things went from, but where's I put together a little timeline of Travis CI's most important moments in relation to open source builds. Note that we're not yet caught up to the end of the timeline. There are many open source developers and projects out there still using Travis CI who either uh, haven't found the time or motivation to migrate to TravisCI.com uh, or elsewhere, ideally, as evidenced by the massive daily influx of jobs. Okay. What's that, sorry? Massive, this massive daily backlog of build. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mmm. Jeez. Those who, like me, finished migrating to TravisCI.com in the last couple of weeks get out of the backlog hell and are now realizing that we are going to have to beg for extra build minutes after our 1,000 trial plan build minutes run out. Uh, okay. Your account name. How many credits? Okay. Sorry, but no thanks. I don't have enough time in my day to send off emails every few days, weeks, months requesting extra build credits so I can continue maintaining my open source projects. That's fair. Yeah, I can see... I can see both sides of the argument so far. Um, looking in the gift of the mouse, as I said earlier, I am appreciative of the acceleration in my own growth and career that Travis CI enabled over the past decade. And there are so many other services with generous offers for open source maintainers that I appreciate and try to support in any way I can. Uh, I just fear that, uh, like when Google shut down Google Code in 2015, this will have some cascading effects on some of the smaller and less maintained open source projects. Uh, and I know personally this whole project is going to soak up around four weeks' worth of the time I can devote to my free open source work, meaning that it's a month out of my open source development time. That's just vanished into thin air, not fun and not motivating. Well, um, I think... Um, hmm. Depending on the price and model... I think depending on the price and model, I would weigh up whether I want to spend a month moving thing, moving things around, or just paying. Like I don't have a problem paying for things. I don't. I don't have an issue with that at all. I can't see. Um, and and, and Jeff, you know, Jeff is a very very smart guy. I don't think he's going to have um, an issue paying neither. However, four weeks worth of work. Yeah, look, that's that's a lot of a lot of hours. That he's, that he's pushing out there in order to migrate. But I think at the same time, depending on the price, I'd probably just pay. I think, depend, depending on, on, like he's got a lot of Ansible, um, he's got a lot of uh, Ansible roles and things like that that he maintains amongst many other things. So maybe the cost would be too high, but at the same time, depending on the quality he was he expected, the time builds and stuff like that that he expected. Um, it might even it might even just be worth paying, but let's have a look. I'm looking to have many supporters on GitHub sponsors who have helped me make my work more sustainable, but most open source maintainers have either a fraction of the support I do or not at all. Okay. So he's then moved over to GitHub Actions. Uh, but the Actions Travis I took this month without any prior notice. Uh, when's this article from? Didn't they say? Didn't they say that they did notify people though? Uh, recent announcement. I thought they said that they initially announced it in twenty eighteen. Open source on TravisCI dot com. On May second, twenty TravisCI announced open source projects will be joining private projects on TravisCI dot com. So it's not quite. Um, they didn't notify anyone. I would argue they did. Maybe Jeff just missed it. Um, but my good, blah, blah, blah. okay, force my hand and now I have in the middle. It bugs me when blogs and articles are not dated. Yeah, yeah, I don't like that at all. Um, I did used to do that myself because I was writing blog posts that um, I felt didn't require dating. 
but I, d- I try and date them now because I, yeah, I, I do find it infuriating when you kind of, well, how old is this knowledge? Um, when does it apply? Should I waste my time reading it if it's 10 years old and I'm using a tool that was made six months ago? Um, so on and so forth. It did remove the timeline, that's, but that's okay. It's not, don't, it's not too important. Let's have a look. Probably two to three weeks on process moving everything off Travis CI yeah, fast possible game behind the bill failures. Anyways, enough for my sub story. Once a link. Yeah, okay. I mean, yeah, he does he does maintain a lot of um a lot of Ansible stuff. Um he's also got he's also got books as well. Um He he has a lot of like roles and stuff like that, uh, for sure. Um as all his roles that he maintains. So he does. He does a lot. He does a lot of work in 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 the Ansible kind of field. So I can understand where you know all these are obviously open source. He's got all these CI here. Um, there you go. You can see the GitHub actions there. That's pretty funny. Let's go have a look. At this one. UCR container build CI scheduled six days ago. Two minutes seventeen seconds. Love it. Let's have a look. Uh, I think these two main issues for open source maintainers. November 2nd, 2020. Travis CI announces new pricing model. Effectively ends generous open source offering. November 2nd. Uh, I'm going to announce a new pricing model. Note, I noticed none of my builds are working. I ran out of credits before. I even saw the new building. Uh, okay. Uh, two jobs. Let's have a look. I want to see how this is actually... Uh, so what's the let's reset the bill, let's reset the zoom. So that's what it looks like normally. Okay. That's a really confusing UI, like matrix why are they like that on top of each other? What does that does that signify something? Matrix module, let's go click on here. Okay. So there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven steps to lint it. Two job with one job being nested. Uh, molecule is an is an Ansible testing framework. I know that much. Set up the job. Okay, check out the code base. Run the molecule tests. Okay. Yeah, the UI is a I don't really like the UI. That's quite kind of confusing to be honest. Um, but anyway. Alright. All makes sense. Uh I think that Yeah, I can see why the people would be annoyed at Travis CI for that. I do feel as though they did sort of make people aware that something was gonna be um happening as early as 2018 but i mean look let's be honest who reads these blog kind of blog posts when people um sort of you know when these companies announce things you know who's really it take it takes it has to it has to reach reddit and hacker news and and discord and things like that for me to see those see those kind of things oh excuse me um let's have a look uh, if you're going, so we're going back to the topic of Git, GitHub versus GitLab. If you're going advanced stuff, uh, I, I'd recommend Azure DevOps. It does almost everything you want. Yeah, that's, that's getting a down vote. Uh, if you have the time, what's the GitHub status page? We have had small outages just about every day with GitHub and Actions. Oh, dear. Uh, really? I'm quite surprised by that. Let's have a look. All systems operational. Do you do his? Yes, you do do historic. Okay, August, September, incident resolved, incident with code spaces, incident with GitHub packages, GitHub packages, GitHub packages. So two in the morning, then midday, and then early hours in the morning again. Hmm. Oh, hang on. That's not even all of them. Oh my God. Ooh. Okay. That's quite a bit. Yeah, there's quite a bit of downtime there. Sunset and API. Okay, instant with code spaces, instant with GitHub pages. Hmm. Fair enough. Uh, I've used both. I like GitLab. 
CICD better. The actions aren't quite fully baked. And when I was using them about a year ago, weird, inexplicable worker failures were pretty common. Uh, you can use GitLab CID for repos and GitHub if you want to test it out. Uh, I realized that I realized what Jeff was talking about. Uh, I took rid of the migration page. I have no, they have no mention of a turning off Travis org. Uh, okay, when it will be turned off. So they sort of announced something was happening, but they didn't really clearly sort of speak to um, when, why, and what, and things like that. Yeah, okay, that's fair enough. Yeah, it's a good point. Thanks for thanks for pointing that out, mate. Um, where's my thingy gone? There it is. Yeah, look, I, I'm a massive, I'm a GitLab fan. I really, really prefer GitLab. I prefer the CI, CD stack. I uh, prefer the integration with everything. It's all very uh, sort of cl close by and so, on and so on and so forth. Uh, we've got one here for um, Terraform grunt work or cloud formation. We've got Plumi versus Terraform. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna gonna cover that in a, in a more detail. Uh, what are the things we as engineers uh, don't? Yeah, that's the one we just covered. I need to. I'll do. A, I'll do a video on that one. Uh, what other things? as engineers don't spend yeah okay uh do developer productivity tools when uh which one should i pick get her mental the mental aspects of devops hmm. let's hit the um let's hit the subreddit the dev subreddit now now michael you being a gitlab fan i have a question for you is gitlab becoming f is gitlab becoming a feature creep um I think that they're trying to focus on being an all they're trying to focus on being a sort of all in one um GitLab tool. Yeah. Yeah. They're they're trying to essentially go, well, we know the DevOps is about communication, collaboration, breaking down silos. We know it's about C I C D. We know that C I C D is a core component of uh, of of DevOps. Um ultimately it's about taking operations and, and the code and bring them really close together. So that it's very easy to push some code and have a CI pipeline uh, execute, and so yeah, they're, they're trying to become that sort of all-in-one. You do your project management in here with with re, with with regards to the actual code itself. Like I wouldn't be doing the project management for you know the marketing of the of the like. So if you had a uh, a repository that contained all the code for a microservice that powered like a certain form on uh, on a web page that like you wouldn't be doing your marketing project management in there that'd be completely separate but anything to do with um the, the development of that service they've got the project system bed in there with the proper kanban boards and swim lanes and all kinds of stuff uh yeah and then you you put all your documentation or your ops or your kubernetes auto uh, auto devops stuff all goes in there and it all just connects and links so yeah i think that they're just trying to create a sort of overarching um, it's such a big product that I've not used everything. There's a lot in there that I've not used. And some of it's behind some pretty expensive paywalls as well. And get expensive really quickly. Uh, new role, they won't listen, help. Oh, no. Um, what's this? I was recently hired in a somewhat successful SaaS team of roughly 10 engineers. Main reason I was hired was my experience with ops and microservices. Currently, the ops is, is incredibly fragmented, like nothing I've ever seen. Microservice architecture, Heroku, ECS, EBS, GCP, Cloud Run, EC2, to name a few. Wow. Tons of different stacks, and even the stacks that are the same have no consistency. The money and the velocity, they are, are blowing every week is astounding when I see how much time devs spend struggling in, for a better word, a pile of shit. Yikes. Uh, in my onboarding, they lamented... To me um and the other newcomers how they focus on disruption and new voices okay i want to introduce serverless kubernetes either gke autopilot or aws fargate pull all the services into a mono repo and unify mm, i don't agree with that and unify configuration with a single build pipeline plus a bunch of other best practice microservice 101s really are they mm, okay um i'll take his word at this given that i've never really built a full blown product built consistent and prior entirely of microservices so um mono repo microservices that's a, sorry, doesn't sound right to me neither um i wouldn't say that's a 101 at all but i don't really know enough about microservices to sort of say yay or nay so 
yeah, I'll, I'll, I won't comment on that one. They asked me in my interview what I uh, would do in this situation. I told them the above. They loved it. They hired me. I'm really experienced in K8. Now I'm two weeks in and there's basically nah. We don't see a place for that on our stack. We tried similar tech and it didn't work. I'm incredibly frustrated. I'm a professional. I left a really cushy lead role for this. Is it silly to handing my resignation? Hmm. This is a good post. Uh, might take a take the copy of this actually. Put it in the old uh, the old backlog of things that I might comment on. Let's have a look. Um, the common thing for K H person to do is ask the question. Yeah, are you are you using it right? Are you using K H? Are you interested in it? And then if they're saying no, I feel like as a candidate, yeah, I see both sides of the coin. I feel uh, what services is that using replace the case feed? Yeah, I feel as a candidate. Um, more questions could have been asked. Like he could have, he could have proposed that there and then, uh, and then asked more about the stack. But I guess if he's gone and said that in the interview and they said, "Oh, we we love it. Yeah, we really love that idea." Um, that's not really indicative of them saying that they're go gonna go ahead and do it. Um, so, um, I don't know. This is a tough one. I can see both sides of the coin. New person comes in and wants to introduce yet another platform. Realistically, could take a long time to slowly migrate everything across and might not be the right solution for most use cases, during which time you could decide uh, it's not right for you and leave them with even more tech debt. Okay, yeah, okay. If I were you, I'd find smaller wins rather than total platform shift right off the bat. I agree. There's a great book called um, The First 90 Days, and The First 90 Days sort of talks about um, how you should develop uh, it has it has frameworks inside of it and stuff like that, and it talks about how you should identify key stakeholders, um, who you can, um, who you should sort of speak to and learn from in order to add as much value as you can. Um, not the first ninety days, the first thirty. Is it the first ninety days? I think it's the first. Let's have a look. I think it's the first ninety days. I always forget the Yeah, it is the first ninety days, and they talk about how um, within the first quarter of your employment, you should be a net value adder as rather than a detractor. Um, and as a contractor, this obviously works really well for me because I'm only usually at places for upwards of six months before before I move on. And so having a framework that I can use to go in and be like, okay, who's who? What do they control? Um, what are their objectives? And the, you know, what are their KPIs? And what are their... Um, um, responsibilities and then working with that information and a, and a framework to kind of go okay how do i add the most value um helps you sort of focus where you're gonna sort of what what hills you're gonna fight on and defend and that's what this person's saying here is i would go with smaller wins straight off the bat um ordering that book now cool yeah so it's a good book adrian um i would um i would i would agree with this i would i would go with those sort of like for example when I, at my last engagement at bhp we didn't have uh they didn't have any kind of ci around the terraform but they had thousands of lines of terraform code that were building actual infrastructure they had over probably about about 150 160 terraform modules that were doing all kinds of things for them in aws in azure uh, but they had no testing or linting or standards or anything like that. And as a result, um, there was lots of stuff I could look at, right? There was a huge range of things that I could have looked at. I could have I could have said we should look at this, we should look at that. But straight away, coming from someone who's um really into going in and seeing what the DevOps culture looks like, and then trying to get DevOps practice in place. The first thing I noticed was this Terraform code, code needs to be uplifted to a higher set of standards. There needs to be better code reviews in place. The master branch needs to be needs to be protected, and it needs to be at minimum linting, using Terraform Validate, and ideally using something like TFSec or some other tool um, in order to um, check for common security problems. And then, of course, um, they were like, we want to use Sentinel. So I was like, great. So then that's get, getting some Sentinel policies in place in order to protect the platform from abuse um, before you even got to the AWS SCP policies that do, the, do, do essentially do the same thing but act as a second gate. Um, and so I chose that battle, um, and they agreed. And over six months, there was lots of standards were put in place. A CI pipeline was built. Um, 
lots of work was done around um, uplifting people, education, cultural changes. And they were all just small little steps that led to a much larger piece. And so when I, when I ended up moving on, they were in a much better position. So I, I agree. Um, start with something small and try and change those things um, at a time. Yeah, let's give this guy a good old... Let's buy more coins. Awesome. Whoa, slow down. You're expecting too much and trying to do t too much too soon. Yeah, I agree. They're not going to willy-nilly change out their entire platform and re-architect everything based on a new employee who hasn't even gotten their first paycheck yet. Yeah, spend time, spend time learning and listening. Exactly, yeah, so true. Then develop a roadmap. That's what that book talks to, um, first 90 days. Um, in fact, do I have it here? Might be a home, actually. Uh, no, I don't have it here. No, it must be a home. Um, it talks to things like, yeah, listening, um, developing a roadmap about how you're going to approach things and you're going to approach, uh, who you're going to approach, how you're going to approach, and so on and so forth. Um, no, it's good. Yeah, it's really good. Uh, and then figure out the steps needed to get there. Then figure out what incremental changes you can make to steer the ship in the direction. Steps your roadmap. Great. Yeah. First seek to understand, then to be understood. Yeah. Who said that? I can't remember who said that. Um Nostril Spiders. Okay, Nostril Spiders there. Quote of the day. First seek to understand, then be understood by nostril spiders. Beautiful. I love some of the names you get on Reddit. It's just ridiculous. Um so good. Such a great response. Uh, I think you should reconsider your uh, mono repo single pipeline position. What you're doing there is making ops easier, not development. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And uh, don't know what your SCM is, but if GitLab, you can use master pipelines that you control, include those in the repos the devs are using and allow them some control over their build deploy while enforcing your ultimate standardization tools. So what he's referring to here is in GitLab CI, you can use an include statement and you can point at a completely separate project in a completely separate group elsewhere within your sort of GitLab ecosystem. You can include that CI file in and then those steps will run. Uh, sort of like templating, yeah. Um, and then you can then do your own steps underneath. And so you can include stuff at the top. You can take it a step further and you can completely remove full CI control from them and you can have a project with a CI file inside it and then you can have another project and this is your developers and you can, can configure this project to pull the CI from here um, over and then you then provided based on permissions if they don't have permissions to change that file that's being referenced any git CI file they create is irrelevant sorry, is irrelevant. It just doesn't get used at all. And so that allows you, if you want to, to completely remove control entirely. And it allows you to uh, centralize a CI pipeline. We did this at BHP with regards to our Terraform components. So we essentially, uh, again, nearly 150 of them. We wanted them all to have the same pipeline and go through the same checks. And so we use one repository with a CI file in it. And then every single other uh, Terraform module um, basically used use that file from there in order to in order to ensure that um it was just a single single pipeline right across the right across the board um so that was really powerful so i, I definitely agree with this uh, i also find it funny that the fact that this person is still probably in their probation period yeah exactly um it's easier when when you're when you're um a permanent employee yeah you go into a probationary period um and i think you should get out of that before but then, I mean, at the same time, the the, the you know the, the the first ninety days, as the book will speak to, is even if you're in probation, that probation period is a chance for the company to evaluate you and assess whether they've made the right choice, and and the other way around also. But also, the probation period is a chance for you to kind of show off and get some value add, which is what that book covers. And then once you've once you've done that, you get out the probation period, you pass it, and then your career continues as a contractor. It's kind of interesting, actually. Um, contractors don't really have a probationary period. We're, we're sort of hired, like you wouldn't leave university and then immediately become a contractor. It's very unlikely you're going to find any contracts because even though technically speaking, a contractor isn't a consultant. So a contractor is essentially a piece of temporary labor that you pay more money to because they've got to go out and find work again three, six months down the line. People treat contractors almost sort of closer to a consultancy 
uh, type role. And so as a result, when I go into an organization, my word is is held more higher than um, I'm not seen as someone on probation or someone new or someone who's wet behind the ears. I'm almost seen as a consultant. So when I come in, I'm fitted in the team straight away and my opinion has weight straight away. Um, and so, yeah, it's not just strict up, uh, sort of like strict, um, pro- there's no probation period. I just kind of, I kind of go in and start working straight away. But yeah, it, there's a guy who will still be in his probation period. And like these comments are saying, and he's just, whoa, just, just rein it in a little bit. Uh, I like this comment here. Yeah, as a developer, the single repo solution sounds like a nightmare. Um, I agree with those two sentiments there. Uh, I think you've received some very good advice here. The only thing I'd add is next time, consider not using your Reddit account with your real name. <laughs> um, ooh. I'm not going to do it on stream, but I wonder if you could chase him like track him down i'm not going to do that but i wonder if you could oh my god yeah i think that's probably a good idea um i started at a new place uh, a little over three months ago to lead a team of devops accessory cloud architects to help facilitate a cloud move company is in heroku now and moving to aws some small uh production things like elastic search and AWS already but app services are still in heroku big part of my role is to get the existing developer community community um roughly 100 in years, up to speed in AWS concepts, tooling, etc., and help them containerize their apps and get them running in AWS. Uh, leadership hasn't done a great job of getting the existing development community on board. Okay, they just assumed that because they said it was happening, the devs would be on board in spite of my repeated request for more leadership time uh, talking about the project. As such, the devs are taking out their fears, frustrations on me and my team. Every time we interact with teams to do trainings or pair up to prep apps for the move, we get little progress made because we have to spend most of the time reiterating the decision to move to AWS. Yeah, okay, it's been awful and I finally finally broke. And in my notice without having a new job lined up and the leadership are freaking out because it will look really bad for them to have a recently hired staff level engineer and tech lead leave. They are trying hard to convince me to stay, but I just can't. What I'm trying to say is I would find something else before this burns you out. Hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't do it under my real name neither. No, I mean, well, I, I mean, it wouldn't really. If, I mean, I do do it under my real name per, per, um, per se. Um, it's under the name of the company. Um, but yeah, my name's everywhere. It's not like I'm trying to hide anything, is it? Let's be honest. Um I found some of it before. Yeah, look, it's interesting. Um I wouldn't I wouldn't quite leave just yet if I was this person. I would I would probably take the time to see if I can if I can adjust and learn first. Yeah. Um I'd I'd listen and see if I can make some small changes. But it depends on your ob- objectives in life. Like as a contractor, it doesn't make f- any sort of economic sense for me to go full time because I can earn substantially more money and effectively never be out of work. Uh, I learn more. I, I network more with more people. Um, I get to play with more tech, different environments, different industries. My experience goes through the roof. Um, eventually, because of my extensive experience in state, state government, um, I've not done federal yet because uh, I don't have citizenship. Um, but once I do get citizenship, all of that experience will will and already does even today leads to a lot of job offers from federal government but you've got to have assistance for some of it um that will involve going to places like uh canberra and stuff like that so you got you gotta i think he needs to sit back and sort of evaluate his sort of uh his objectives and kind of go well what is that what is it i want to achieve here what am i trying to do and um if his conclusion is i want to make i want to make lots of money then i would just get the experience under my belt and then go contracting. But if he really wants to make an impact, wants to make a change, wants to own something, then possibly moving to a smaller organization, maybe a startup would be a better idea where you've got more sort of control and agency over enacting changes. Uh, at a large company, I think when you go into a large company, uh, it's somewhat naive to assume that you're going to be able to go into somewhere large and well-established and start making substantial changes. It's never going to happen. Um, unless they're unless they're on fire, it's just it's just not going to happen. So he, he's saying here, um, 
I'm a professional, very experienced with Kate, so this is a person with a lot of experience uh, who I feel is now expecting to be able to just um, be able to just make changes sort of overnight, which just doesn't happen in large organizations. Hmm. Shame. I hope that they, um, I hope that Andrew manages to um, resolve this uh, and make the right decision. Hmm. All right. Well, uh, does anyone have any questions? I'm going to pop off. Um, it's been two hours. I think a good two hour stream is nice. I don't think you guys should have to suffer listening to me for anything more than two hours, but I'm happy to, if you've got any, anything you want to talk about, um, I'm happy to answer if you have any questions or anything. Thanks for the stream. You're welcome, Meg. Not a problem. What am I going to do this afternoon? I think I'll pop this video on YouTube right away, I think. A few people typing. Uh, one last question. Uh, you ever use Compose CLI since I didn't realize Docker was... Was that sneaky? I've never used Compose CLI. No. Do you mean Docker Compose? Thank you. Enjoyed the stream. Any comments on change control? Um, change control. Okay, that's a good one. Um, so you mean generally uh, making a change within a software project or, or something like that? So or or maybe to a uh, piece of infrastructure. Um, it's a it's a it's a good question. It is a hard problem to solve. That's why entire frameworks like ITIL uh, were created to try and manage and um, put put strict controls around when you when you when you implement a change so that it can be rolled back you can be understand who authorized it who did it what steps they're going to take to do it what steps they're going to take to roll back uh what kind of um disaster recovery is in place and so on and so forth most organizations look i'll be honest i've gone through now several large enterprises and governments over the last three to four years uh only governments really have a lot of change control in there uh, large enterprises do have change control, but it depends on how big the change is and what it is that you want to change. So most teams that I've worked on, they and most teams that you'll probably work on, will um, they'll control what they own, and so they can sort of just um, mostly just do what they want, really. Um, it's when it starts affecting other people or whether it's a major change, such as like maybe like, maybe like an API breaking change or... Um, something that's going to affect end users, that's when you need to start taking change control really seriously. But it, change control isn't something I feel you can do. Like, so say you pick ITIL. You can't do ITIL for everything, internal, external facing, every tool, every utility. Uh, it doesn't. It wouldn't scale. It would bring the organization um, to a complete halt. So it depends on what the change is, what it affects, who it affects, whether it may involve data loss and so on and so forth. But overall, I would say assess what, what the impact is going to be for a given change and then determine whether it needs uh, more than a code review, whether it needs organizational oversight uh, and so on and so forth. Yeah, that would definitely be the way I would go there. But it's, it's very much um, about assessing the situation. Uh, no worries, Adrian. Not a problem. Um, Compose CLI is the V2. Docker Compose Convert. No dash. Oh, change control. Yeah. So oh, you mean like so Docker Compose. So Compose is now a native subcommand of, of the Docker command is what, is what you mean, I assume. Not that either. Do you have a link? Compose CLI. Docker. So it is related to Docker directly. Okay. Let's have a look. Um, this Compose CLI tool makes it easy to run Docker containers and Docker Compose applications in the cloud using either AWS, ACI, and Kubernetes. Okay. Docker can easily run your Compose applications since they rewrote it to go. Okay, Compose VK, local Docker Compose has moved. This project is about cloud integrations and Docker Compose V2 code has moved to Docker slash Compose from Python. So this is the, the, the new one. If I click that link, um, 
so yeah, go.mod, that's definitely written in Go. Docking Compose is a tool for running, um, for using, for Docker defined using Compose file format. Compose file is used to define how one of containers. Okay, Windows, Linux, uh, just use Docker Desktop. It's only gonna cost you $7,000. Uh, uh, using Docker Compose is basically a three-step process. Docker file, Docker Compose, Docker Compose, and then Docker Compose up. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, okay. Oh, that's interesting. I've never used it. That sounds interesting. So it'll basically just integrate directly with a cluster now, an existing, uh, so like an ECS an ECS job, or uh, I assume it can be used to just talk to Kubernetes as well, and you just it'll just fire up the, the pods for you. Yeah, okay. That's nice. That's certainly um, That's certainly pretty powerful. I would worry yeah okay well as long as i think that that's not something that the developers are just given and told okay now you can just spin stuff up on the cluster um especially a production cluster i think that's fine um if it if it is for uh, taking it and, and running it against live workloads that's something i would still stuff inside of a um a ci pipeline but then if i was going to do that i think i'd just use flux if i was using k8s and I just have Flux react to changes to uh, manifest files um, is is what I would do. But I would I feel this would buy would could 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 enable people to bypass stuff. So it's certainly a very nice helper. Um, but I would say it's um, very much a way for for people to to kind of sort of bypass things. And I, I just worry. That that's what developers would use it for, um, which is fine again if you're on a dev, if you're talking about a dev cluster, not part of Docker package desktop, part of Docker desktop release or Docker binary download. Yeah, okay, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how um, how Docker um, develops over the over coming years because um, because of the, because of these changes to to Docker desktop, it's going to be interesting to see uh, what else changes with it because of course. Um, if Docker Desktop is the first thing to now start getting commercialized, you know where where does it end with that, right? People people are interested in money, so um, hopefully hopefully they don't they don't continue continue that trend and start um, start commercializing like other things. All right, I'm gonna call it a day there. Um, I reckon. Wednesday we'll do a similar format to this. We'll be a queue. We'll we still have people come on and, and do chat. So it'll be a similar format to this. It'll be a stream. It'll be inside of this channel. Um, yeah, I'm gonna get rid of that QA channel. I'm just gonna have this one DevOps channel. Um, oh, for now, I'll just move it below. Yeah, because you keep <laughs> I keep I keep seeing someone going. It's got one listener. It doesn't have any listeners. It doesn't have one listener. And I'm like, who keeps going in and out of that channel? And I'm not noticing <laughs> you bouncing in and out. Um, yeah, I'll move. I've moved the QA one down. Um, in fact, why don't I just delete it? Look at that. I had the power. Boom. Um, I'll just delete it, and we'll just stick with with this because you can share your screen, and it works anyway, given the number of people that we get through. Uh, so on Wednesday we will. Um, we will do a similar format to this, but I'll also um, people will be able to will be able to have a chat as well. So I hope that that's been very very helpful. Hope you've learned stuff. Uh, obviously, let me know if you want to continue to see stuff like this, and uh, I'll see you on Wednesday. Enjoy the rest of your uh, Sunday for me. Maybe Saturday night for you guys, guys and girls. Um, but yeah, have fun and um, behave yourselves. Thank you. Very nice.